Meetings go way back to um, pizza parlors, chatting about GIS over some some dinner. And so we've kind of now morphed these into this latest series. Okay, so with that, um, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Michael Dangerman as tonight's featured guest. Uh, Michael and I met in the mid 90s while we were going to San Francisco State uh, together, after which time we both landed in Reading uh, to start off our professional GIS careers, Michael at Vestra Resources and myself at Shasta College. At the time, I can recall getting together with Michael and talking about GIS and where our lives would take us next. And Michael soon moved on from there and uh, we've sort of lost touch. And so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing along with the rest of you about what he's been up to. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Marcus Harner from Shasta County, who's another Vestra alum and uh, We'll, uh, we'll get started with uh, with the conversation. So our, our North State GIS conversations, we had decided, let's pass the hat of who's doing the interviewing. And Michael, you got me. Okay. <laughs> so, pleased to meet you, Marcus. Uh, I don't think we our, our paths ever crossed when we were at Vester. When did you start there? I started in 2001. Okay, I it must have been just after I was there. So I went is, to Pennsylvania after that, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. So can you give us a, a background of how you started into the GIS? I'm guessing. Well, uh, when I was a child, I was really into maps. My brother would even draw um, cartoons with me uh, with maps in my pocket, and I would carry an atlas around and everything. And um, I'm just uh, one of the luckiest people alive, I think, is what I think. Um, it's kind of like being named Yastrzemski and being interested in baseball when you're a kid, yeah, because people sort of believe in you uh, from the beginning, and, um, and it, they can sort of see you in this role. But, um, you know, my uncle is famous. He's the founder of... Uh, of ESRI in 1969. I didn't really know him very well at all growing up, and I didn't think I was in the same kind of maps as he was. But And in high school, I was more into politics and international relations. But then in art school, I realized what I was doing was, well, I discovered I could draw or and paint. And so what I uh, found I was doing was analyzing space. And so I wanted to do spatial analysis. I thought this, this is something I could do um, all day long and love it. And it turned out to be the right, uh, the right choice. And so I transferred to SF State and uh, that's where I met Dan and, um, and sort of found my groove there. Um, so that's how I, get, how I got into GIS. So once in, into it, you know, within San Francisco, how, how did the career Career uh, okay. Go. Well, that um, was a slow start. So um, I moved with. Um, well, at SF State, um, I was asking for leads to uh, to um, get a job, and I didn't have any experience. And I found people were like scared of my uncle and stuff like this. Um, and so um, uh, I thought I would. Um, go to Washington DC and look there because my girlfriend had been accepted to University of Virginia. And so I would go to interviews and things and they would, they would say, well, um, you're not really who we were looking for, but we wanted to know who you were. <laughs> so I'm like, gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, and so um, uh, then Finally, uh, I broke up with my girlfriend, and then I um, uh, was visiting California at my brother's wedding, and I thought, well, the user conference is the week after that. Uh, I'm going to go there and just make a stack of resumes and just hand them out and just see what I, what I can do. And then there were a couple of people interested. One was Pacific Meridian Resources, which was in Oakland, or... Um, maybe it was Emory. in Richmond, Emory. Emeryville, Emeryville. And, um, and then, um, 
and then another was Vestra, where I talked to Dean Angelides, and then I interviewed with Art and Dean, and they took me on. And um, so that's how I got started. I started in Reading. Um, and um, so what, what am I forgetting here? I worked there for several years as a consultant for, at Vestra. It was a really good start because uh, working at a consulting firm like that, you learned how to make every hour count. They had really good project managers and uh, they had uh, uh, really uh, bright people there. Uh, I learned a lot from them and um, it, it was just a really good start. I got a lot of experience um, very quickly. I would take books home and read them and start doing, doing stuff, you know, the Monday after it was a really good opportunity for me. And then, Oh, you want to know about the whole career? Yeah. Or so after Vestra, did, it is. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, there, then I was, I found I really loved uh, cartography, and so Vester was actually selling maps that I made with uh, with Jamie um, and uh, Jamie Carruthers. And so um, after that, I went to um, there was a company that wanted someone that could do GIS for mapping, and that was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So I went there. And as I was crossing the country, they changed their name to mapquest.com. So I worked for MapQuest, the internet uh, people. But most of their work was actually um, like project work. We did work for all different types of maps. They had, um, it was incredible in there. They had the biggest private map library in the, in the US um, of any company. And uh, it was really sad what happened to them. They got, they sold the company to, um, AOL for $1.1 billion and then just chopped the company up into bits and, and, uh, and, uh, laid people off. There were like five rounds of layoffs, something like that. It was really sad. Um, there was, there was a lot of knowledge that was lost and, you know, the library was lost. It's was really unfortunate. Um, and then, uh, so after that, uh, I, I was one of the first people laid off because I was one of the last people they hired and they sent me um, and then I work, I went to San Francisco again, worked for US EPA as a contractor. And then um, what did I do after that? I worked for a council of governments in Monterey, uh, the, the AMBAC um, there in Marina. And um, I worked for, then I worked for my dad's business who he, he, uh, he works to save land in California um, for wildlife. And so I made maps and things like that and did some GIS consulting there, worked for fish and game for a year as a stint. And then, then I worked at ESRI for the past 10 years. It was the longest I've ever worked anywhere. So was, at, at, at ESRI, what do you do yeah. there? I'm okay, guessing making maps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm working. Uh, I'm I produce uh, um, layers for the Living Atlas. So the Living Atlas is uh, layers that are available to you uh, in the software. That's literally in the software. You can add uh, base maps. We have a, a base map team. There are a lot of characters. Uh, great people making these base maps that you just add to the map or um, and my specialty has become um, thematic image services things like land cover uh, which you can bring into ArcGIS Pro and it's automatically animated so you you can watch the uh, land cover change over um, 10 or 20 years yeah we have uh, we have for the European Space Agency, we there's land cover in there. Uh, there is, um, so you can just add these layers to your map and start to work with them uh, right away. So are they the time enabled? Are the, the some, layers? Some of them are time enabled. If it, if it makes sense, like uh, one of the things, uh, I care about you guys a lot because of these fires. Um, 
some of them have been just stunning in their scope. I mean, the way they rip through uh, neighborhoods in Santa Rosa and, uh, of course, Paradise and and uh, now Ashland and, uh, you know, that valley in there and, and Redding, too, came almost all the way to downtown. And uh, Australia, too, has just been devastated a year and a half ago. Uh, an area the size of the state of Washington burned in Australia. The size of the state of Washington. And I, one of the wow. things that, that I produced was uh, um, a satellite service, which, uh, which checks every hour, every half hour, and checks the VIRS satellite, which has every 350 meters, it, it has a detection. It detects the, the intensity of the fires and uh, the temperature. And so, so there's these live feeds that in the living atlas, it's constantly being refreshed, it's current. And you have, um, you have, where's the fire now? You can see twice a day or three times a day, it's updated um, with the latest on where these fires are burning and how hot they are. Um, and so that is a service that is logically um, made into a time enabled service because what you can do is turn on the, the time in it and you can display the fires like an animation. So you can see over the past week how they progressed um, uh, their, so they're time enabled by default. Yeah, if you want to use the services in analysis, though, you need to turn the time off. Okay. okay. <laughs> or, or you'll get the default, you know, kind of thing. So, um, so okay. is there a lot of color? I guess um, uh, the cartography of those services um, picking a hot fire is white or. Uh, no fire is some other color. Yeah. Well, we hired uh, she um, Emily. Uh, she worked from um, she worked for the California Department of Forestry, making maps all night as these fires were burning, and she has been styling uh, all of these maps for us, and uh, so all of these things work together. So this is, yeah, that's the VIRS satellite service. So you can see the the more intense fires have a larger point to them. That's um, the 750 figure you see is 750 megawatts. Yeah, they are over there in Midland and Odessa. You see uh, the oil and gas activity. Um, oh. Yeah. So they measure the fire intensity in megawatts per meter or just? Or megawatts. And keep in mind that it is a snapshot. So That's at one moment, saying. yeah, it's like, what's the temperature at this moment? So it could be a fire that's burning like this. And the moment that it's, you know, the moment that it took the, um, that, it, that it took the image is the is the value you get so it's not averaged over a day or something like that so it's it's very much a single moment that's wow. been captured by the satellite yeah these are uh yeah there's imagery that you can add uh that already has processing templates added to them so if you're looking for a burn scar you know you can add some imagery change the template and you already have the burned area that can be used for analysis, things like that. That's what you were showing, right? Some imagery. Uh, Devin is driving. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching just like. Just no like break. <laughs> <laughs> so. Dan, uh, Dan, is, Dan is driving. And Dan, oh, is, Dan uh, is driving. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so nothing is burning in red and good. It's, well, well, it's not so that time of year, of course. Depending on how this goes, I might prefer saying Devin is driving. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it, it finally it finally pulled in the uh pulled in the burn scar yeah and and just like your memory as the as you get more and more time between you and the fire they start to fade away so the points oh, wow the points sort of disappear and so 
and they're all there's arcade expressions that define the color so that they become more transparent as time passes it compares with the current time so you can see how much technology we put into the cartography and how much is how much is built right in to these things you know it's pretty remarkable uh, so is the living I, I was doing a project just yesterday with the living and atlas the yeah. living atlas and it seems like more and more is in there is yeah. is it growing and growing and um so yeah how much it's people like me you know putting stuff in there so one of the next things i want to do is like soils for the world um there's different people have used artificial intelligence um to sort of interpret um values of you know how much sand what percentage of sand and and uh what percentage of silt and you know that kind of stuff and so there's people that want to use this to you know grow more food and so um i've been producing i i maintain 21 layers from the soils if you've ever tried to work with soils in gis it's like oh my god no nope. <laughs> so it? impossible yeah there's there's tables linking to other tables that link to you know many one to many relationship with these other tables and there are different depths and things like that so one of the things that we do in the living atlas is just try to get this stuff into where you guys can work with it and go aha you know i just want the I just want to know how well the soil drains and use that in my analysis. You know, can't, can't somebody make a layer that, that I can just use. So that's what the living Atlas is about. It's about making services that, that you guys can just pick up and use and save you a whole ton of time. So to know which ones to, to work on, I'm, I'm guessing it's uh, people asking for data and so many asks or requests. It's like, okay, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we do is write blogs, you know, so if you can, if you have like a uh, bookmark or, you know, homepage to the blogs, uh, the history's blogs, there's, you know, so many every day and you keep watching, there's tips, techniques, uh, announcements, you know, about what's new in the living atlas, um, you know, hey, did you know you can do this kind of, you know, blogs, topics. Um, so it's it's good to keep keep up with. It's hard to keep up with all the stuff that's, you know, going on in there. Especially for us here in the United States, we have so many, uh, there's so many layers in there. Um, in, in fact, you know, things like the census are just totally different now than, you know, a few decades ago where, you, yeah. <laughs> where, where do I begin? You know, you, um, yeah. Uh, so, so the census you, is all curated in the living atlas. Yeah. There, yeah. There's so to make that easier. And then there's even like a, there's a population model of the world. So you could do how many people live North of, um, of Yuba city. You know, mm -hmm. and in Northern California, so uh, you used to have to like take census blocks, select them, and sum them up, and things like this. But there's a whole gridded world model that's every you know <laughs> ten meters or something with a population estimate that you know. So we're able to figure out like how many people live within the border of Zambia, and you know in Zimbabwe or something like that. So, or how many people, or where do we put these mobile phone towers in somewhere in Asia or something, you know? So do you see the layers, um, the number of layers, is that gonna keep growing and growing or, or do you see as a curve mm -hmm. as crested as like, okay, we got 90% of the, the layers that people mm -hmm. ask for. Um, well, we were, we'll do things like critical habitat. Okay. So we had a few services for critical habitat. One was for marbled murrelet. One is for, um, there's a crocodile species in 
uh, Florida or, you know, things like that. And so we would have to maintain every year we'd get the new data, pub publish the service and put it out there. And then we noticed that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was doing it too. And not only that, but every time it changed, they would update it and put a comment in there. And so we went Hey, can do you mind if just you guys uh, do this this one? And so I wrote a blog showing people how to make rasters from it. Took all our rasters down, and uh, and then um, pointed to the Fish and Wildlife Service and says, "We're getting our data from there anyway. Just use <laughs> use this okay. uh, service and uh, and apply a selection, and you have critical habitat. You know, so." So, and this, and some of the soil uh, layers that I was maintaining, nobody's been using them. So, or oh, really, because you have statistics on how, yeah, how many yeah, how many people look at the page view and stuff, and, and then, you know, where, you know, what state they're looking from or something. And it's like, you know, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's, <laughs> nobody's using this. So, it was a good but idea, then, though. But then we'll get email like, um, you know, hey, I'm in a university in the southern U.S. and I want to just make a table of what kind of soils there are in each county in the southern USA, and I can't do it with the way you guys have set it up. So it's so I would like I put like a quick service up and said here here you know use this, and so I think we're gonna do we're gonna put like irrigated and non-irrigated capability classes of soils next time so we we'll take some down and put some up oh they might they sometimes they come down you take you might take sometimes take yeah down. yeah yeah sometimes we'll take them down but okay. we haven't taken you know the default is just to leave it running so unless like nobody is using it <laughs> or there's clearly something better you know um so um, like, i see a question Dan has mm -hmm. a question. Do you oh. suggest blogs or best practices for accessing and filtering requests to the Living Atlas? Um, yeah, well, um, let me see. Uh, no, Dan, what did you, uh, what do you mean by this? Um, blogs for best practices so yeah we, um, we whenever we have best practices we will uh, we will put them in a blog and share what we know a lot of times us on the team we're the first ones to to use our own services and you know things may be a little bit complicated but powerful and so we'll show people we'll walk people through how to do something like like uh, <clears throat> I put up a service for the, the crops of the USA. So it's like the past 10 years, what was grown in every part of the USA. It's the NAS services from uh, the USDA. And so I wrote a blog showing people how, um, how to find out how many acres of peaches are still grow grown in Georgia. Because, um, you know, it's known <laughs> as the peach state, but... But uh, these days, uh, there's actually more peaches grown in South Carolina, but really oh, California. Really? We're the ones that grow m almost all the nation's peaches. But yeah, it's sort of not the peach state anymore. And oh. so I show I shared a way that people could uh, sum up uh, how many acres of peaches um, were grown in Georgia. So things like that that show a workflow how to how to get these answers out of the living atlas. Wow. So it functions uh, in ArcGIS Pro just like any other service. Uh -huh. So the, the how-to are blogs, basically come up and here's, here, let me walk you through this. Yeah, sometimes there's examples like, did you know you can do that? And uh, mine are real how-to. I mean, I'll like have step-by-step -step showing pictures of where to click and mm -hmm. saying, you know, and then we also have like learn dot arcgis.com so these are educational resources so i built a learn lesson on how to produce your own image services because the uh yeah it, um yeah because uh the there were guys in salt lake city that were making image services um and uh, and we were like 
well, you know, you could make it a little better if you just change this little thing, you know? And so we talked them through and showed them and I realized, you know, this should be, this should be a lesson that we, that people just go on there and they can follow the steps and learn how to do what we do because Nobody's use them they're very handy thank you nobody's going <laughs> to figure this you. out yeah um it's just like it would drive you insane if you had to do it yourself so charles has a question what's a work day or work week typically like in the esri redlands campus oh my goodness well these days we're all working from home uh, so many of my uh teammates are uh, in different places mariposa uh, Palm Springs, um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> San Francisco, uh, S S Pittsburgh, <laughs> uh, Washington D.C. So, uh, but but um, um, a typical day. It, it's all. It's almost like history where we would have to remember what it was like when we were there because uh, we all kind of i carried my house plants home with me and stuck them in the car and my computers and so what i do is i sign on to computers that are there at the esri campus where i haven't been for a year and uh, i work from those computers and set off processes on those and um, um it's a little bit of writing a little bit of education a little bit of uh, let's figure out a better way to do this. Um, I tend to produce a lot of things uh, for the team. Um, uh, we have we have a biologist, cartographer, a, a water expert, um, a guy from NOAA. He worked for NOAA that that runs our team, and he knows all the satellites. So that's kind of where we're coming from is just take, getting things that come from satellites and getting them into the system. So we've been really working on that. Um, um, any more questions? Let's see. see. So do you have any for the, the budding cartographer? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Cartography right. or student. Do you have any suggestions for uh, the students? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I have a number of these. So uh the first one is edward tufty's books are great especially envisioning information teaching you how to use as little as possible like less less is more to to make your point um and that has a kind of discipline for graphics um you know cartography itself is such a great discipline for uh learning graphic arts of all types um one one thing I would suggest is use your own colors, collect your, collect colors. So keep your eye open, you know, beautiful sunset, take pictures. And then uh, what I do is I have like a bunch of swatches and I, I take the pictures and take colors and keep them and keep them in a place where I can use them again, because uh, you want your colors to come from nature. You don't want, you don't want, um, a programmer who uh, has three hours to make uh, some color ramps to do this for you. Um, you want to you want to do it from nature. Um, another thing is read our blogs because there's new stuff all the time about how to use uh, Arcade uh, things like that. If that's if you use our software, um, you know I was thinking what's the most exciting time to be making maps in history. I mean, there was there were great maps in China when they started to understand the river systems and keep track of that. And there were, you know, for the Europeans when they started to discover the Americas and you started to see that appear on the maps. But I'd have to say that right now is really the most exciting time in human history to be making maps. It's right now. So um, as the, it's really uh, fantastic. And there's an explosion of cartography right now. Uh, one thing you want to know is how to participate in our culture directly. Because um, 
like um, you, you guys are the people who know, uh, who know how much snow is in the mountains or where, how much smoke is uh, where and where it's going. And you know how many people are on the freeway on Friday and people need to know this stuff. They're getting information from all different places. And so we, you guys are the ones who know uh, the facts. And so you need to put it right in culture where everyone can see it, take it right to them. Um, what we used to do in the old days, we would make a database or we would make a report and we'd put maps in the report or we'd make a map for the boss. Sometimes we'd make a map for a public meeting, but these days we're making maps to tell people directly the things that we know. So, so that's really important is to learn how to, how to be a part of our culture itself. You need to take the map viewer all the way to the subject. So um, people will ask, you know, what does this map need? And it's like, well, all the little details have to be there. Uh, if I walk into this map, I don't really understand what's going on. So you need to um, show it to people who don't ma read maps regularly. And, and uh, so that you know if people are getting the full understanding that you want them to. Um, if you're making maps for the web, it has to work at every scale. So you may, so that gets you away from the sort of, uh, I'm making maps about this data set because really when you work at every scale, the data set changes <laughs> based on different scales. Yeah. So, so you'll have like a, um, so it, it's really not that a, about that anymore. And so, and it has to, you have to pay attention to the detail at every scale. There's a lot of details and getting technical, like with our software, you can use uh, what's called arcade and you can put the comma there, you know, uh, you can format text, you know, to make it clean and work in a sentence and, um, you know, getting really technical gets it really uh, clean and beautiful. Um, yeah, and then like working with Living Atlas, I, one of the things that I liked doing is DJing. And a lot of that is just working with other people's material. And the Living Atlas is sort of similar. We're like producing uh, producing layers that for other people to use and sort of, you know, uh, mix uh, like, like just like DJing. Um, so I think that's all the... That's a mouthful, sorry, a lot of uh, advice. Um, and for students who are, who are new, um, stay away from the expensive universities. You know, Dan, uh, Dan and I, I think we got a head start uh, not going so far into debt uh, by going to SF State. Community colleges, I went to community colleges for years. Uh, they're great. Um, and so, um, like Confucius' uh, famous thing he said, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's true for me with cartography and GIS. Um, so try to find, find that thing because you're going to have to be working a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're going to hate it if, if you don't love it. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, what so else? Is there a, kind of a follow-up with the online versus printing maps? Um, yeah. I guess you can I'm, put a lot into online, but how do you translate yeah. that into something printed? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I'm a print map kind of guy, and the online uh, people just went and just passed me by. So I'm like, I'm like, what happened? You know, I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, make maps for online myself. Um, yeah, print it, it's, it's different. I mean, on, on, a, on a screen, you have uh, LCDs or something like that. And you got, it's backlit. So there's light shining in your face. 
But uh, printed maps, of course, it's white paper. So it's meant to reflect light that comes down back through it and back at you. So you have to have a lighter touch with the printed maps um, than, um, than um, an online map. Things are getting darker. They're getting dark. And the, the things that you want people to see in your map show up bright, like yellow plasma or red plasma kind of colors. That doesn't translate well for paper. Um, so uh, I would I would use a light touch on you know paper maps and uh, but for but people seem to really love for online mapping dark backgrounds with bright lights on them you know type of thing. Um, so um, I think one last one. Look at the time. Um, <laughs> is there any trends that you see geospatial trends? Um, where are we going from here? <laughs> um, just, I tried to write down what I think I see. Um, so first we're having more diverse points of view with the new generations. And this is great because, um, I remember in the nineties, you'd go to conferences and there, and I'm like, you know, I could count like the number of black Americans I see here on one hand. But things are changing, and now there's more people from different backgrounds coming into GIS, and they're seeing things that we didn't. Um, it, speaking for myself, like uh, I live on the border of Queens and Brooklyn, and um, there's no soil data here for me, and the you know the water keeps pu uh, puddling up, and I want to help my community solve this problem, and so we have people going, well, where, where can I get data for this? And it's starting to bring, uh, bring these perspectives into GIS. Um, we have uh, GISers, yeah, participating directly in culture. So like some of the people on our team are making, are maintaining uh, this map for Johns Hopkins University of the, um, of the coronavirus that does updated daily and it's really making a big impact so um uh, one of the, one of my colleagues said they hit 2.4 billion views and they had a counter that was counting and they hit the limit of 32 bits you know the number that and wow. it just caused all <laughs> kinds of things to mess up right so um so we you know we never would have known about that stuff but it's starting to get like right into, um, you know, everyone is starting starting to use it. Um, the new map viewers that we have um, for online in in uh, for ESRI's maps um, are uh, kind of stunning. I mean, if you've used Photoshop before, it won't be very new. But um, you know, some of our cartographers they said, "Oh, we're going to have blend modes in." in online mapping. So instead of just transparent layer on something else, you can use one layer to multiply another or or cut away something else or or take this layer, turn it to black and white and put relief over it in sepia, which you define and then put like colors on it. So this is the stuff that's been in Photoshop for years and it's just starting to take off within, um, within the SRI. Um, artificial intelligence, this is something that's not ESRI only, but they have, uh, I've, I've seen blogs. There was one just last week, someone developed a way, um, now you're going to cry because you're an old, old, uh, user of GIS like me, but, um, you take an image and, and someone has developed an artificial intelligence, um, method that you can just download apply it to your image and it finds all the building footprints in the image well that took about four years off of work <laughs> yeah exactly so you so you kind of so there's and there's another one that microsoft is working on uh and um we're, we're working with it them i guess and it's a 10 meter resolution land cover map of the world um in like 
10 classes. So they use, they use artificial intelligence for that. So there's nobody going, oh, that's a, that's farmland. And <laughs> that's, yep. that's an urban area. Oh, is that a road? You know, so, so they share these, uh, these, these modules. I can't remember what they're called. I should be, yeah. And, um, and you just apply it to an image and, and it cuts it up into land cover classes. And, and if there's something wrong, you can make it learn, right? Mm -hmm. Scary stuff. Um, yeah, you think about it, it's like someone could, you know, there used to be like, there's no way you could count everybody's fireplace, right? But, uh, oh, but maybe, wow. maybe there's a way, I, I haven't seen this, so, but um, maybe someone will go, you know, if we charged everyone who's got smoke coming out of their fireplace $10 a year, you know, so just just start thinking about this stuff. It may be coming. Um, and then the scales, of course. So, so um, Naomi, you said you had an architecture background. Where it seems like GIS is going into that scale. So it was sort of like landscape architecture scales. You know, parks. What you know, what to do with this national forest or this piece of land. But no, it's like indoors now. There's like ArcGIS indoors where they walk down the hallway with a trolley and it captures data. And then you have people in that work on big campuses that have an app or something that says, okay, to get to your meeting, the fastest way is to go this way. Saves, you know, millions and millions of dollars for to not have people get lost and can find your meeting and not run it over five or 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, just the potential of this stuff. So those are the things I could think about. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Eamon and Devin are doing moderate, moderating questions. Okay. Um, okay we've got I'll a, let them take over. We've got a question from uh, Naomi as well. Um, okay. Do you see it in it? Uh, do you find that it is important to understand statistics and data science techniques to design good maps? I would say yes. Um, to design good maps, maybe there's some things you could do without um, a really good understanding of that, but um, I think that it it is really important. Um, and then she also asks, also, does it seem feasible that GIS technicians might be replaced by AI at some point in the future? Yeah, I think I could probably be replaced by it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm putting more and more into scripts that will just maintain, you know, uh, maintain it. And how far is it for then from, I mean, some of the things I set up already goes, okay, is there a new file there? Yes or no? If it is, okay, download it and then download all the stuff, put it together, package it, and update it on the internet. So so, <laughs> so I, I've just replaced uh, a person, but maybe not, because it may have new, uh, new, um, new things. But yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, especially things like building footprints that maybe artificial intelligence uh, would start by uh, uh, with a consistent um, data set. And then uh, the, the place for a technician would be at the margins and to say, well, that's not, that's clearly not a building. So, so the technician could spend their time looking at the exceptions and just let the AI handle the rule. But I don't know. I think, yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of things are getting replaced by AI. What were some of the first ones? I think the stockbroker was like one of the first things to really. But um, yeah, so um, interesting world we're living in. Uh, any other questions? We have. Well, I I have just a quick one. Uh, the Esri user conference, they just announced that's going to be uh, online this year. 
are you going to be attending and how do you see uh, your role at the user conference? Are we going to be able to find you there? Um, you could always find me there if, if it's not in uh, posted anywhere. Um, I spent much of last year, it, you know, there was, there was kind of chaos for us uh, just trying to meet people. So we just made ourselves available and see if anyone dropped in a certain area, then they get directed to us for questions and, and things like that. And then they could um, meet me and talk to me for like 15 minutes. And I, I don't know, it might be different this year. That was, they had about 12 weeks, something like that to get all that stuff together. Right. And yeah, and we all took crash courses in video production. You could see my super thrilling video wow. um, in, <laughs> from last year, but I think they're cutting our roles back a little bit. And so I, I don't know. I think it's going to be a little bit different than, oh, it's the same conference, but it's, we got canned videos that you watch. It's going to be sort of like, a little bit different but to be honest uh i saw for years and years i saw people get on planes fly to san diego from all over the world putting tons and tons and tons and tons of co2 in the atmosphere and you know it's nice to see if people can make it work um from these video links like this so it's Definitely, it's an uh, interesting experiment that maybe right. ne would have never happened. Right. Seems like it could work. Do you uh, do you see it coming back face to face, or do you see that being a long term trend? Probably, um, probably coming back. Um, I don't think it's going to be a long term trend, but who knows with this virus? Because uh, you know we all thought it would be over what when <laughs> when we all took our computers and went home how long did you guys i mean honestly think you would be back in the office how long did you think i was thinking a few months and um because i thought everyone would just stay home and then they'd go out and wear a mask and it would just sort of disappear like you did in new zealand and right. <laughs> these other countries that had it together oops <laughs> <laughs> But as it turned out, we were like one of the worst countries. We, we are the worst country on earth in our response. And it's kind of sad but, um, that so many people have died. Uh, half a million. Michael, we've got another question in the chat here um, from Denise. Do you have a favorite living atlas layer and why? Um, I think, uh, there's one that I would call like the sleeper of the year last year. And that was the European space agency, um, uh, climate change initiative, uh, um, land cover. So you'll find it by searching on global land cover in the living Atlas. And when you add it to an online map, it plays as an animation. You can see, uh, changes over time on different places. Um, you can see like the capital of Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, which used to be like a little tiny town in 1971. When did they get independence? And then it was, you know, fairly good sized city when the data uh, takes over in 1992, um, which is when, when, when the frames start playing. And now I think it has 20 million people in, in that area. Also, uh, Shenzhen, which is the city right across the border from Hong Kong, uh, that uh, has exploded into, uh, into one of the world's mega cities from almost nothing at the beginning. That's pretty interesting to see, too. And, of course, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, where there's been big changes uh, in uh, in yeah in b big changes over time and um, and uh, it's kind of scary to look at. Um, yeah, if you zoom right, you can zoom right in. I mean, this is like I forgot what the resolution is two hundred fifty meters. But then, uh, 
Yeah, does it play? Huh. Okay. Is it, it's on pause or interesting? Oh, I think what you need to do, this time slider, it's like hitting our head against the wall. But you need to move the slider, the two parts of the time slider together to see just one frame. Yeah, so move it all the way to take some practice. Yeah, okay, that's good. Okay. And then press play. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so now it's displaying like eight years at a time. But if you move them together, then you see one year at a time. So, yeah. The time handling, we have people in our team that just go and scream at them. <laughs> Why isn't this better? <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. I'm, I uh, Thanks for asking that question, Denise. And, um, yeah, I, I wanted to, um, again, um, Thank you, Michael, for, for taking the time. And uh, it's, it's been really enjoyable. I wanted to just kind of um, touch on a couple of things for the edification maybe of, of students and others that, that yeah. you mentioned that I thought were partic particularly uh, noteworthy. Um, one of which is up on the screen now that Living Atlas um, has this focus on real time and up to date and topical themes like fires and soils and, and land cover changes and, uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's, it, it, it um, I get a, I don't know, misery loves company or something, you know, the, the, if you build it, they will come, doesn't always necessarily work. Right. So you talked about that with the soils, maybe, you know, sometimes we go back to the drawing board and find out what, what people want and maybe the need to be able to find out and discover that those things are out there. So I did put your, that blog out in the chat and I think that's a super useful thing. And uh, as somebody who didn't uh, get much in the way of formal cartographic training, I, I really appreciate some of your insights. Certainly Tufti is, is pretty well known as an author. I, I loved your suggestion of, of photography, using photography. And, and now with the tools being able to, um, you know, pull in a photograph, a color that you like, get the RGB or the hex values off of that, and then generate your own swatches that you use and I think um, you know the old adage of avoiding the defaults I think you talked about that you know if you mm -hmm. just choose these defaults assuming that uh, it's the right thing is is kind of not not really a good practice um, yeah as a general rule um, I was going to add you know I think uh, it's really helpful to um, look at great cartography and and the Esri books um, the Esri map books a lot of which are online is a great uh, source for, you know, kind of some really um, beautiful examples of, uh, of maps, many of which have very artistic uh, qualities about them. But I think also just spending time looking at maps. Unlike you, Michael, I, uh, you know, my dad and my brother were the map geeks. I, I didn't really pay much attention to them until I got into GIS. And so uh, nowadays, you know, if I'm being a, a couch potato sitting with with an atlas or an esri map book in my lap you know sometimes it's just sort of your mind wanders and and you see things that you wouldn't uh, necessarily see at a first glance yeah uh, i love the fact that you said this is the most exciting time um you know and uh, this this idea of of knowing your place and and then learning the visual uh and geospatial tools that are out there um and Actually, my um, data capture classes, I, I kind of laid this out for them this week. And I, and I increasingly find myself, uh, you know, wanting to get the boots on the ground in a location and then step back and say, okay, now let me look at this. Let me rotate it in 3D. Let me actually see what this looks like through our uh, viewing capabilities. I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, mm -hmm. I love your I love your uh, DJ analogy. So I think we should all strive to be uh, cartographic DJs where we're. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and I also think of like the artist Robert Rauschenberg, who used to go around his studio in New York City and just collect items, you know, collect objects, and and so it's like, <clears throat> what's what's really happening is like in our time that there isn't like a lot that's produced from scratch. So a lot of the art of it is bringing together places 
things from different places and making it something new, you know? So I think it's a different kind of uh, process than people might be expecting when they start uh, doing cartography. You know, that Michael reminds me of, of something, you know, this topic of, of AI came up and uh, actually interestingly enough, when I came out this morning for my morning coffee, my wife was listening to the radio and Fresh Air was doing a book that's just been released on automation and job losses and, and AI was kind of a major topic in, in that whole thing. And uh, there were some really interesting insights. And, and one of the things that he said is, is, as you pointed out, things like identify all the square looking things on an image is lends itself very well to AI. And, you know, those sorts of jobs are going to tend to get lost. But the things that require a human perspective, um, the kindergarten teacher analogy, I thought was a great one. You know, there, there's so many yeah. human elements at work there that it's very hard to tell a machine to do that. Um, but yeah. I, in some ways, the, the cartography also, um, you know, we like to see maps that feel like they were generated by human beings that have a creative quality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the same time, we also like things that machines have checked because they can check a few thousand things <laughs> and narrow down the 20 or 30 that we really need to look at. And also like in terms of storytelling, like, you know, telling a story about the fires and, you know, these types of things that where, where we can kind of bring it all together and, you know, talk to channel seven and talk to uh, the, the Reading searchlight and stuff like that and get sort of bring, bring what you guys do in as a part of that. So people get more of an understanding of what you guys know. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's that, there's that, uh, yeah, the human part of it is, that might be stronger, a stronger role for us humans <laughs> with this technology where we just let the machines do, you know, the technology stuff. And then we have, what do we have to do? Be more, better storytellers, uh, DJs and <laughs> be, be able to, you know, um, you know, say, why is this important? Or, you know, uh, what do we have to know about um, the Beatles eating our forests? What's that mean? Um, that uh, we're not getting as much rainfall or things like this, you know? So, so this is all the stuff that, that we can focus on too. But I don't really, I'm no expert in where we're going with artificial intelligence. There's just things I can see that, that are kind of uh, um, game changers, you know, um, and are just beginning. Yeah, those are, you know, I, I really appreciated your insights too on, on the online versus paper maps. I, I like the idea that, you know, having backlit screens is a fundamentally different way for us to consume the information aside from the scale factor. And as you point out, Michael, I, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day, and I kind of feel like I've been sort of stumbling and bumbling and grumbling about online, all this RTIS online stuff that I don't really understand because I came up, as, as most of us of our generation came up in this sort of desktop environment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And yet you realize how powerful once you get sort of like the visibility scale range stuff dialed in. And I think there's some real, uh, you know, I, I love some of the things they're putting into uh, the beta viewer uh, for ArcGIS Online. Although I have to say, when you talked about the cutaway, mm. it made me nostalgic because I have this great lab that I wrote that the students had to create their own mask, uh, you know, to be able to like fade out the background. And now it's sort of superfluous because the tools do it for them. Yeah, all that. Uh, I was just thinking about that too, like how how okay i'm going to start my map first you need an ocean polygon or you know <laughs> <laughs> or something that would draw the ocean blue you know so you're starting really from scratch well that's 
that's not the case anymore. I mean, most of the context can be just sim simply added as a base map. And um, the, the base map people are, are super, super cool too. I wish I could take all of you guys through Redlands when, when we're back up and running um, uh, someday. I, I vote yes, that would be very, yeah. very cool. And meet the the base maps uh, team. And uh, one of the guys, he's from uh, Calgary, and he had a map that showed Redding on it. And I'm like, did you know? What do you know about Redding? He's like, oh, I was just curious about it because it's one of the places with the most sunshine, you know, in uh, in the United States. So it it was it was a place that fascinated him too. And so we got a bunch of, one of the guys there, um, um, when I first interviewed at Esri, was one of the uh, guys I worked with in Pennsylvania. And he, I think he didn't finish college, but he was just such a um, production guy, uh, a cartographer. He made maps for National Geographic when I was back east. Um, and uh made all the like city maps and he was one of the first people on the base maps team and seeing him there i was like this is a really good sign because it meant that that esri was no longer going to just say well here's some points lines and polygons but they were really going to go all the way and try to make something that looked nice uh when you added it to to arcgis and um and, yeah and and so I, th I thought that was a really good sign and was one of the reasons why I wanted to be there because uh, uh, was seeing him there because it meant something good was happening. Michael, did you ever work at all at National Geographic? I, I thought I remembered that, but I might have crossed my wire. No, although there are a few atlases of theirs where you'll see my name in there. And that's because where I worked at MapQuest, um, they had a lot of the work go through um, like the atlas pages and stuff. They were working on those. They had MapLex, you remember that? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they were doing, actually producing the layers for the atlas in MapQuest. <laughs> com in, in the cartography shop so uh they made uh, they made some really amazing maps in there but it was always for somebody else so um no i didn't i didn't work for ngs there was um there was um i was a consultant for so long that it seemed like i worked for everybody but um, oh, right now I, I'm kind of doing, I'm doing a project that involves National Geographic a little bit. And it's like helping prioritize parts of the ocean for protection. And so uh, there's some maps that, that they produced and I helped um, put these on the internet so, so that they could share them. Michael, you might be interested, uh, Matt Merrifield, who I think might've come in behind you uh, at San Francisco State, but he gave our keynote for GIS Day and we have the video on the North State GIS okay. website. And he talked about some of the work, um, both with the conservation on that, that great um, preserve uh, on the Central California coast, but also just some of their marine coastal uh, work that they're doing with some really interesting drone activity and so forth, so. Okay, yeah, this was uh, something my aunt and uncle that they did was they gave the biggest um donation ever to the nation to the nature conservancy in history and it was basically point conception i can't remember how many square miles it was but yeah, um, that matt was talking about i think it i think he has a picture with jack and laura from uh when he got to visit the uh, visit the site so you, you'd enjoy, yeah you'd enjoy seeing it and they've taken the given giving pledge, so it's it's going to charity, you know, when, um, the, the fortunes they've made. So, um, so this is this is one of the things they wanted to do, which was like, you know, hey, uh, we need to be doing this stuff now, and we need to save the planet, you know, for real, and. 
Um, and so they did this as a way to sort of challenge Silicon Valley because, you know, the, that's not being done very much there at all. It's sort of going to yachts and going to, you know, this kind of stuff. So, um, so I, I was really proud of them for doing that because um, I think it's sort of like an honor thing, you know. Um, well, my dad was the director of state parks and my cousin is over in Denmark. She's studying climate change. She's a biologist. And um, so there's a strong tradition of, of this in my family. And I, it made me really proud of them that they did that because, no, because it's really hard to get the state to like buy <laughs> a big chunk of land for wildlife you know there's so many other things that like do we keep some schools open or you know <laughs> this kind of thing and and at some point you just kind of have to make a move and say okay this is gonna this is not gonna become ranchettes and so anyway i was really proud of them yeah, that was uh, commendable and am amazing. What a legacy for such a vital part of uh, California. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks again, Michael, for, uh, yes, for taking the you. time. It's ni nice to reconnect. Uh, yeah, for sure. Hopefully, hopefully the next time it'll, it'll be uh, face to face. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I, yeah, someday. And I've got a van and so we're going to do trying to figure out how we can sleep in it and then we'll have the van life and we'll be up through your way nice <laughs> <laughs>